oftentimes like uh, what you know tends to happen or get picked up in the media is the extreme case oh. you know some sort of robot is going to take your job or it's going to do all of these things yeah. whereas a lot of times there's different flavors or levels of ai <laughs> Everybody, welcome back to this. I'm your host, Shauna Griffiths, and today's real leader is here for a real talk about what he's doing to help transform business, create business impact through the intersection of people, tech, and learning, um, specifically in AI. So I'm going to welcome Nabil Ahmed to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Shauna. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. So, so folks, um, I always tell you how I know my guests. So I know Nabil through George Swisher, who was on the show back in January, and he was talking about launching changeforce.ai. And so George and Nabil are co-founders. Um, so if you missed it, um, I'll just give you a quick update on AI. Um, it is an AI based platform that really helps leaders start to predict and see the problems in business before they actually happen. So a little bit of crystal ball <laughs> is how I like to think of it. Um, so I also, um, am really proud and excited to say that they have, um, that I'm a part of the consultancy that they just launched. Um, so we'll get into that and how it went from launching the software to adding the human component. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit, but, um, Nabil, I would love for you to share with the audience, like, how did you, how did this come about? What did you and George really see when you, when you started changeforce.ai? Sure. Thanks again, Shauna, for, for having me on. And thanks for those who are listening right now. And, um, yeah, just quick background. So where George and I, we came together where, we were doing a lot of work in very similar space, working as consultants uh, initially, and we kept seeing some of the same problems over and over, same challenges that organizations have. They're sort of making decisions based off of like old data, or they have like a business or, or whatever growth strategy, but they're, they know their strategy well, but what they're lacking is what they should focus on next and why. And so that's where we kind of came in three, four, five years ago or so to kind of build some software to help focus on the biggest problem areas. So helping to sort of resolve that painkiller. Then fast forwarding really over to the past couple of weeks, as you had just mentioned, Sean, is around the consultancy side. And where we have seen over the past few years, honestly, is that you know AI is such a new and fast moving thing. And I know we'll we'll unpack it a little bit more uh, in the in the coming moments here. But uh, but just to start us off, uh, one of the big things that we've seen is that while we see a lot of leaders and organizations who are really interested in it, there's definitely some hesitation around just sort of pulling the trigger, so to speak, and 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 implementing a software. And so that's where we launched the the consultancy side because where we've really seen the business leaders, they, they kind of need a helping hand in, into, into managing some of this powerful AI software and really help someone to help them fly co-pilot, so to speak. So that's where we've evolved over the past couple of years. So looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think as people are listening to this, there's a lot of preconceived notions, I think, about AI. And I think we were talking about this before we started recording is um, the trending article I saw on LinkedIn um, over the weekend about it was saying that they had surveyed these top companies, I think it was like 50 companies, and it was showing how AI is really um, predominant. They were saying that like 70% of organizations are using it of the ones that were surveyed, but they think that 32% said that they're going to want even more of it, or they're seeing it as, you know, continuing to unfold. Um, so I think it's good to see and hear that, you know, people are, are like adopting it at the same time. There still is that notion of like what it is. So people think it's language. They see like chat GP and all that stuff. Right. And then you've got the, um, you know, or just for photos, you've been seeing that usage, but it, even in the article, it was talking about predictive analytics. So, you know, again, I, I talk a bit about this software and how it really is like predicting that sentiment. Sure, sure. And yeah, a lot of it really is that, you know, when we start to see AI, there's, I think a lot of the fear comes around the unknown. You yeah. Know, but maybe as a quick analogy is like, if 
we've all applied to jobs before, right? And so you think it's going well. And then the worst part usually of the sort of application process is you just waiting to figure out like whether you are advancing to the next round, getting an offer or the company's moving in a different direction. And when you don't know, usually the worst thoughts come into your mind. And so the reason why I mentioned it kind of on the AI side is that it, it's very expansive in the sense mm -hmm. of there's, uh, oftentimes like uh, what you know tends to happen or get picked up in the media is the extreme case oh. you know some sort of robot is going to take your job or it's going to do all of these things yeah. whereas a lot of times there's different flavors or levels of AI there's things that can sort of augment and do some of the the, the grunt work so to speak to help you then make a better decision so it's yeah. augmenting or, or giving you an assistance there then there's a lot of the things where you know it comes up in, in the media around, like it's autonomous, it's, it's gonna fully replace things. So where we have seen a lot of the you know interesting opportunities in, in relation to some of the work that we do is really the augmenting side. So mm. kind of in the middle saying, okay, what are the things that humans can do, but maybe don't enjoy doing as much or that a machine can do better? Mm. And then can we, so for instance, analyzing lots of data across multiple channels, finding patterns and then presenting the top three or five sort of uh, ch challenges or opportunities, then mm -hmm. presenting that to a human for them to then say, all right, here's the paper trail or digital trail of how this software was able to do that. And then you human are in control and can make that decision. So that's where we mm -hmm. think really that the opportunity uh, exists today is, is in that augmented side. But again, many times people are looking to, to have it be fully autonomous where can this replace of an existing thing that I've done before. And while it may make sense in certain areas, for us really, it's saying, what are, what are machines good at? Gathering lots of data, finding patterns, presenting a short list of findings. And what are humans good at? Taking those findings, understanding the context and nuance of the organization and industry that they're in, and then making decisions off of it. And then the AI then comes and then tracks those decisions over time and then starts to give some insight that can be more helpful for a leader. And that's really, yeah. again, I'd say in closing is that that's where I think the next generation of leaders can oh, really yeah. evolve to is not necessarily looking at a technology or in this case, like AI specifically as being in competition with them, but really work, working more on the same team and helping them out. Yeah, it actually makes you a better better leader. It makes you yep. more able to focus on where your strengths are. And I love that part of it. And I think George said uh, uh, some somewhat similar in that it's it's not this replacement and AI like it's it is that combination of the AI and the person, you know, together, mm -hmm. not just AI on its own and replacing. Right. And I think it's really good. I'm glad you explained all that. So for listeners to understand kind of like how can we start to break down some of those resistance feelings, some of that fear and start to think about, literally we have to like reframe how we're thinking about this new technology. Yeah, one quick example I get if it's okay, Sean, is that uh, yeah. thinking 10, 15 years ago, if you think like ATMs, you know, like yeah. you're going in to get some money from a bank or depositing something. I remember if I got a check, for instance, or if I had some cash and I wanted to go put it in the bank, instead of going inside, I would have to get some envelope from there and write something on it and then stick that envelope with the cash in the machine. And then all of a sudden one day it says, oh, no more envelopes required. Just put your cash in directly. And I'm like, I remember I, I had lots of hesitation. I'm like, I don't know like what's going to happen to my money then. But yeah. part of the interesting thing why I bring it up, Sean, is that around this fear is that saying, well, part of the way to get over it is, well, why did you trust that the ATM was going to process your money just because you wrapped it in paper? You know, you put it in an envelope. Like, well, why would that make sense? Whereas if you didn't put it in paper, it, in your mind, it wouldn't make sense. So part of the, what I do in, in sort of helping leaders and organizations to kind of get over that fear of like new technology is really just to point out what they're doing already and how comfortable they are doing it. And once they start to see, oh, you know what? I actually do a lot of this. For instance, you know, more modern one is, is using like your phone to pay, right? Tap to pay. I didn't really use it until COVID came around because then yeah. it was, you know, uh, wear gloves and all that. And I'm like, oh, let me just use my phone now. And that, that helped me as a, even as a tech person kind of get over that fear or hesitation of not yeah. using necessarily a new technology. So I think that's really the way that I like to explain things is, is saying, 
here's an analogy of what you're doing already. And here's how this is just the next evolution of that. And it's actually not that much different. Yeah. It's such a great example. Cause as you were talking a few moments ago, I was, my brain started thinking about like, gosh, phones, you know, or what was that technology or as the, some of the thing that I've been thinking about is actually even a, you know, from a skill standpoint, mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, as we are continuing propel right in, in, um, in business, people again in, in that linkedin article it was talking about how people are looking for ai from an employee standpoint from a job um you know from candidate standpoint so i think that it's it's also really good for us to remember especially as leaders that the more we actually push it away the exposure to it we're actually missing out on something we're missing out on the opportunity to actually add to our skill sets so i think you know even when I said that, I'm thinking back to like when social media launched, I, I will admittedly say I was so late to like join Facebook. I was like, I don't want any part of that. And then, but I quickly realized this is here to stay. This isn't going anywhere. That's only going to, um, you know, multiply from like a platform stand standpoint. So I think it's really good for us to also keep in mind that it is becoming more pro prolific and we really do need to think about how we can almost like allow ourselves to break down those walls and start to experience a bit and think look at it as how can it actually make us better yeah definitely i mean you had a great example it's social media and then maybe 15 years ago or so like mobile devices was a big thing i actually did my doctoral dissertation on how people use mobile devices in the workplace to help them do their jobs better and I won't bore you with any of that because that's good sleeping <laughs> material there. But 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 the point being is really then like imagine before like the first smartphone came out and about 15 years ago is when the first iPhone had come out. So oh. whenever I was doing my research, it was clear that things were going to start to change in organizations on how they use mobile devices. And then so mm -hmm. the question, I think now this is the next evolution, in my opinion, one of the next big ones is around using AI. Like, yeah. could you imagine not having yeah. a smartphone or a mobile device? and being able to access your work email or calendar, et cetera, there. So to your point, it's really the question of, it's less about should we do this, but right. it's really more about how and what are yeah. the most effective ways for us to leverage this to make things better and or easier on ourselves. And that's where, yeah. I, th that, that's where I think really you know, taking a step back, that's the role of technology. As someone with a tech background, it's not mm -hmm. about like the latest tools to kind of do things that are you know kind of cool and fun and quirky, but it's, how yeah. does this actually make things better mm -hmm. in whatever ways that I'm looking for? And if it can yeah. do that, then it's a value add in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes a ton of sense. Um, so actually you started to say something about like your background. And so I also wanted to say folks, um, Nabil is also a professor in HR. And I bring that up because before we get into your background, I would love for you to talk about the role of changeforce.ai related to HR. Um, you know, because I think that is, that's a lot of times where we get worried, right? It's the like big brother concept of sure. AI coming in and, you know, and, and HR really is that hub of, while we all need to be caring for the people in our care, HR is really has that core role in an organization. So, so can you talk a bit about how, um, the platform is, uh, used in the HR capacity and just kind of that landscape? Sure. Yeah. And I think you hit it right on the head, Shana, with the, this talk around people. So yeah. you, you usually like more, lots of, lots of times more quote unquote modern organizations really trans are, are reframing the department HR from human yeah. resources to maybe more people and organization or human capital. And that is where I think there's a, a big opportunity. So if you look at, for instance, putting on the business hat from a C-suite or CEO point of view, if you ask any CEO, what's their top internal challenge? 95% of the time, it's something around their people or their talent. Mm -hmm. And so then the question becomes is, what do we know or not know about our talent that we can help to drive further to make sure that we keep the good people so we retain yeah. talent? And so we do a lot of work in that area. Or what are some things around uh, you know, working well within teams, for instance, mm -hmm. because most people, their perception of their workplace is based off of the team that they're in and not necessarily right. the organization as a whole. So there's a variety of these things. And if you think from a broader scope, if you expand HR in the DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, 
L and D yeah. learning and development. That's really my background. And you start to see a lot of these things uh, from a loose perspective are, are related to HR because at the end of the day, they're really driving back towards people and some of the internal things that they are doing or maybe not doing to help drive the success of the organization forward. So where kind of the, the mix between the HR, the human capital or the people side with some of the change force work is we have a variety of, let's call them like strategic frameworks, like to say, mm -hmm. okay, well, do you have a uh, future of work strategy? So mm -hmm. knowing that AI and all these digital technologies are coming next, how can you map that back over to what the people are thinking about it and what they may need right now? And so that's where our software kind of can, uh, has come into play is really helping to define what are those key objectives and maybe more measurable outcomes that mm -hmm. people are and organizations are interested in, in relation to their people. So we, we've seen yeah. lots of, uh, you know, interest, I would say around that and definitely lots of opportunities going forward. Yeah, absolutely. How is that? How have you seen, especially during the last three years with everything that's gone on with in the business, I'll just say community landscape um, with, you know, COVID, the, the pandemic, the shutdown in office, people getting pushed back to office. So has that dynamic, how has that changed what or made you think a bit differently about how to utilize the software or how to or the need for it? Yeah, sure. And so, you know, thinking about like how people communicate, a lot of what we do kind of starts with digital communication. So say like chat and messaging, for instance, or like if you're in meetings, like a Zoom meeting or a Google Meet or whatever else. And sort of trying to understand like where the conversations and the work is happening and how can we extract useful information that will help drive the success of the organization forward but really keeping in mind the privacy and the security mm -hmm. of individual users. Because a lot of times where there's hesitation, and I think rightfully so from people mm -hmm. and organizations, is when they introduce, for instance, like technology, there's a fear on like, well, what is it actually doing? What is it gathering on me? Is it sort of a big brother type of thing? Yeah. And again, part of what I do is what I had mentioned earlier is to say, well, here's what your organization is already doing with your, on your work computer already. So understand what's happening oh. right now, but at the same time, say in order for an organization. So for instance, like for our software, not to bore you too much with the, 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 the inner workings, but at a high level, yeah. it's really trying to figure out which, which way the wind is blowing, not right. who is blowing the wind one way or whatever <laughs> a certain person is saying, but it's saying yeah. what is happening in general and how can we as an organization get ahead of that by, again, as you had mentioned before, few times the predictive side. Can we predict right. more of a leading indicator instead of a lagging indicator on, we are starting to see this happen. Let's get ahead of it before it gets out of hand. And that's mm -hmm. really where so this software can help because again, a lot of like really everything that we do, a human can actually do, but a human wouldn't want to do because yeah. it's analyzing a bunch of uh, messages that are already available to a leader but the leader doesn't have time to do that nor do they, may, do they may not have the expertise or accuracy to do it at scale for thousands right. and thousands of messages. So, so that, that's where we see kind of the, the challenge as well as the opportunity going forward. Yeah. But I mean, I think it's really important as you were saying that I was thinking back to how many times I've been in an organization where I'm, I'll hear people say, well, leadership doesn't get it. They have no idea yep. what's going on. People at the top have no idea how we're really feeling. And that is a reality. And I think some of that to your point about knowing which way the wind is blowing, because I think so much as you're trying to, whatever the work you're doing and the output of that work as an organization, a lot of times that the focus is there and the focus may, even though you, you may think you've got your hand on the pulse of the people, but perhaps not. So, you know, I just, I just thought of that when you were saying it, because I really have been in situations where I'm like, how the hell do I solve for that? You know? Right. And so, and a lot of times that's just because, well, there's one or two people who staff will go and talk to, and then it's the grapevine and conversation. Sure. But I really think that like speeding that up, getting out ahead of it. Um, I think, you know, again, as people are listening to this, really thinking about more being on your toes rather than on your heels. So, um, yeah, yeah. Definitely. 
And real quick, the one of the things is in a best case scenario, typically, if an organization does figure out which way the wind is blowing, what they'll soon realize is that that was the direction the wind was blowing three, six months ago, because right. that's what that's how old the data is. So a big, a big part of why we started kind of the AI side is to really give real time information uh -huh. where, again, leaders can do something about it to where it's more of a leading indicator instead of right. lagging to where then they can actually get the change and sort of instead of being more proactive instead of constantly being reactive. So yeah. that is some of the advantages of like having kind of a technology based approach. Again, it's not about using the technology for technology's sake, but really yeah. saying, okay, as you had mentioned, Shauna, okay, people are talking about these things and it's sort of being informally uh, sort of analyzed, but can we do it in a little bit more rigorous manner in a timely fashion to where we can actually do something about it and see those results. And that's where, yeah. I, again, a lot of the AI software or really technology in general, I think when it's in that boat, then it yeah. can be much more powerful. Yeah. I just think like cutting down that chatter of that, that internal chatter, well, this is happening or that's happening or do they even realize it's also, if you can cut that down in like time frame of it, you also cut down the drama yep. and all that goes along with it. So, yeah. um, that's, I don't know. It's really exciting. Um, but you were saying earlier about how, like you really worked in this, this focus area through, through your career. So I want to get to your background a bit. And sure. I'm curious at what point did you really get more like this passion that you have for that intersection of people, tech and learning. And cause you've, you've had a really rich career in that. And I'm curious, like, where did that spark come from? Sure. And so I, I think it probably started when I was in maybe like high school or college. And, and the reason why I say this is that a lot of my jobs, like during high school and college were kind of in the customer service space. And I may be aging myself here, but I'll, I'll go ahead and run the risk of doing this is that <laughs> I work tech support a long time ago for uh, gateway computers. I don't know if you remember those, but that was a computer that had like a cow box. And this right. was you know, right around 99, 2000, somewhere around there. And I was just entering college. And the reason why I bring it up is that I was in this training for a week of learning all these crazy things about how to take apart a computer and put it together because that was part of the job to help do this, but it was over the phone. And so the reason why I mentioned this is that it was clear to me after those week or two of training that everyone else knew much more about me than about putting together and taking apart a computer. So we get on the floor, so to speak, of, of taking live calls for customer service. And it turns out over the course of a month or two, I was pretty much in the top one or two of customer service satisfaction. And what I learned then was that and I mentioned it a bit before, is that it's really not about the technology. It's about how you can communicate to people mm -hmm. and understand what they need and use the technology as essentially a conduit mm -hmm. to help you resolve any challenges. So that was very informative to me because again, I had worked these jobs in high school and then I was in college and started doing that. And I started, honestly, I started out as like an engineering major, but some of these jobs that I had, I realized, you know what, if you know just enough about the technology, and even if you know everything, because the people who knew way more than me were getting frustrated, they were slamming their phones because they weren't able to communicate to someone who didn't have their knowledge oh. of how to resolve the issue at hand. So that's really where I learned to say, okay, it's good enough to have a certain level of a background, a technical background, so to speak. Then uh -huh. I went more on the sort of how can you apply this in organizations? And that really encouraged me, as I had mentioned previously, where I got my doctorate kind of in the educational side to better understand how do people learn? And then how can you, in this case, within an organization, leverage technology to help people really do their jobs better, whether it's learning some new skill or just achieving a, a sales quota faster or whatnot. So that intersection is, is really where I've been the past. 15 plus years. And, uh, and I feel like it's been an exciting time and, you know, it's always changing, but I think at the yeah. core, some things still do remain the same. Yeah. And so you, where are you teaching now again? Sure. I'm teaching at Columbia. So I, I, I've taught there for maybe 10 plus years or so. And I teach graduate classes. I've taught mm -hmm. at teacher's college, which is the grad school of education. And currently I'm teaching in the school of professional studies. Okay. So in, in the department that I'm in or the program is human capital management. Uh -huh. So it's kind of in this sort of HR people space. And really it's more towards working adults. So who have mm -hmm. full-time 
uh, jobs and they are looking to, you know, you know tip, the typical student is looking to kind of improve their position or maybe perhaps uh, work more deeply in a leadership uh, role within mm -hmm. the human capital sort of people side of an organization. Yeah. And so have you seen, like, what are some of these advancements that you've seen? And maybe it might be HR, it might be with some of the students that you've had over time, but I'm curious, like, what that shift has been. I think a lot of times, air quotes, HR can get a bad rap almost, or again, we were talking earlier about stereotypical sure. things that people think about AI, I think they think about it at HR too. So I'd love to hear from you. What are you seeing as far as advancements, shifts in that space? Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just to shed some light. Yeah, definitely. I would say over the past five years, in my view, the biggest shift that's happened within HR traditionally has been more uh, a, a transition from more of a back office. Like, let me talk to you about my benefits or if I need to file a complaint about something and more towards let's have the deceased suite wants you to sit at the table because again, as I had previously mentioned earlier, our number one concern internally is talent. So yeah. I think the strategic shift from being more transactional and administrative mm -hmm. to being more strategic and aligned to the business, that to me is the number one change that's happened. And so in relation to that, Honestly, what I've seen is that over, you know, I've worked at several organizations, uh, enterprise level, smaller companies, and typically those HR professionals don't have a background either in business or the industry that they work in. So it's oftentimes good for them because they can switch jobs fairly easily because they have no context of sort of the business, but now becomes that challenge to say, well, we are looking for you to play, we, the, the C-suite or the business, yeah. we're looking for you, HR, to play a critical role to help drive our growth strategy forward. Mm. And so I think a lot of HR professionals or executives have been kind of uh, taken off by this because it's not their background. But to me, it makes sense because really that's, again, part of why right. I sort of work at that intersection is to say, okay, how can you take sort of a business mindset, apply it to the people, and do something that is is going to be beneficial. And I'd say probably the, the latest, uh, one of the latest sort of trends that has, has been growing rapidly is around this reskilling or upskilling. So oh. what are the skills that I have now? Uh, what are the new skills that the organization needs? Uh, is there a gap within those? How do we fill those gaps? And can we leverage our current workforce population to upskill them to be ready to have those skills? And so there's lots of conversations around that, but again, it all, in my view, goes back to the organization, the business. What does the mm -hmm. business need? Because yeah. you can learn things just for the sake of learning it, but in a professional context, the organization wants to invest in you and really learn, uh, wants you to learn what they feel mm -hmm. like they're going to need in 6, 12, 18 months. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, one of the most incredible people that I worked with, a very good friend of mine, Gina Durante, and she had an HR role, but she also had the business background and the yeah. finance background and understanding all of that. And she was such a great partner to me. And that was such a wonderful feeling of, even though she didn't necessarily understand a certain, you know, she wasn't a marketer, she wasn't a, sure. a brand partnerships person, but she knew the fundamentals. So when we sat together and talked as leaders, she truly felt to me like a partner creating solutions for it, for our people, for the business. So that's a really great point that you're making. Yeah, I feel like really in summary is if, if you can be a translator, mm -hmm. then there's lots of value in that. And that's what I feel, Sean, exactly what you described is that you don't have to be an expert in, for instance, finance, but even if you're in HR, but if you can translate between the departments and, and be that go-between, yeah. there's lots of value in that. And in all honesty, I feel like I've that's really how I was able to accelerate my career because even when I was looking, let's say for hire, uh, interviewing for jobs at different organizations, I would tell them, well, I have a tech background, I have a learning background, I also have a business background. You could hire three separate people for this, or you could hire me who I could be able to translate and work with teams across those three different areas. And pretty much all the time it worked in all honesty, because you know, like the way you explain it there is like, why wouldn't you want to have someone who could step across multiple areas and bring them together. And so that's where yeah. I think that's a, 
the, probably one of the big, hopefully one of the biggest takeaways for our conversation today is, is be the translator. Yeah, I love that. It also goes back to, as we were talking, we talked a lot about communication and about how even changeforce.ai and the software and the consultants, it's really helping to close gaps in communication. So it's been a nice thread, I think, through you know this conversation today um, that so much can be solved, I think, through that communication. Um, the art of doing it, the quickness, you know, and, and the tools you have at your disposal. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's regardless of any organization or profession is your ability to communicate clearly what it is that you're seeing or what it is that you need is, uh, is, is highly valuable. And I think at all levels needs to be taught even more or at least practice as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because we have a lot of um, leaders, uh, you know, people in leadership positions that are that are listening to the podcast. I'm curious what your thoughts are for like any suggestions that you may have for people who are in a seat of leadership and they are either their feel for resistant or they're they are on board with, you know, a new technology with AI with a program like that but they're facing other people who have that fear and resistance. And we talked about it a little bit, but I think as we're, you know, nearing the end of the conversation, I would love your thoughts about any tips or suggestions or resources that you think that you could point people in the direction of to help them know how to close that gap. Yeah, I think it's, um, and this is part of why we launched our consultancy sites, because we were seeing this a lot, in all honesty, that, you know, people were very interested in it, or you had an internal champion, but then there was resistance, either within the organization, or maybe amongst themselves on hesitation on, I don't know if I can do this. And so I like using the word like co-pilot, because yeah. it's saying, all right, on one side is the technology, on the other side is a person. So to help kind of ease some of that, uh, tension or yeah. uh, challenges there. And, and so I, I would say that's one is, is always try to work with a human to mm. help you bring, in this case, let's say some software along to be able to implement it. At the same time too, the, I always like saying a part of what we've done is that even though our software, it really integrates with a bunch of tools and provides real-time feedback is to say, can you start with some decision that you've already made in the past and let's just analyze it and just see what the, the tool recommends. So it doesn't affect anything currently. So it's more of a, oh, okay, this allows us to kick the tires mm -hmm. on something that is low slash no risk, but it gives us an understanding of how the tool works. So we've done that with people who, who are with the clients and organizations who they say, all right, well, we were interested in, in using some you know, type of technology we did some employee engagement survey. Can you take that data and just tell us what the AI recommends, mm -hmm. even though we've already made some decisions on it? So it, to them, it's more of an interesting thing. And, and it kind of uh. opens up the conversation where I would say in summary, I think the opportunity, and again, this may be just because of my background, is to try to educate. You know, right. I think really most of the work that I do is just educating people on what this is, where the opportunities are, where there's some potential pitfalls. Because if you can, even if they decide to do something else, it, it, that's less important really for me. But if they come away having a better knowledge or understanding of what uh, some of these tools can do or some of the concepts behind it, I think it's a win-win all around because they'll remember yeah. that. So in yeah. summary, I'd say uh, fly co-pilot you know, with a, a human, start out small, and maybe compare okay. it to uh, to something that you've done prior, and, and right. uh, those oftentimes I, I've seen uh, have have had some successful results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's the other thing I think about also is like being able to prove a business case, and if it's like you lose a client because you didn't know they were feeling a certain way, or you exactly. lose staff because you didn't know, you know, it's like really you can look at that and go, well, if we don't take this action or we keep doing what we've been doing, which is not working, it's that bang the head against the wall thing. But if we can save some of that, so yep. um, you know, that just that also comes to mind for me. So um, then, so the last thing I want to ask you, I always do this with everybody, and I know you mentioned a little, you gave a takeaway a moment ago, but if there are any additional takeaways that you hope, whether it's about HR, tech, the intersection of people, tech and learning, 
Um, any takeaway that you want to make sure that the um, audience gets from your uh, episode today? Sure. Thanks for that, Shauna. The one thing I would say, and, and this will be new, is is really a lot of times what I advise people is when they're working with technology is, is understand what technology can do well and what it can't do well and understand what humans can do well or maybe better at. And to me, again, the the gathering, synthesizing, presenting information, technology is very good at that because it can work with volumes of data, it can find patterns, et cetera, there. So you're, that's going to be a losing battle if you want to go that way. The, where the opportunity, I feel, is, is, is for us is to say, what are the things that you would not be comfortable with technology doing and double down on those? So for right. instance, creativity skills, understanding the culture nuances of an organization. You could maybe entrust technology to do that, but you probably wouldn't want to. I know I wouldn't want to. So <laughs> that is, that's what I would say is really saying, yeah. what are those skills that even if technology can do it, that you may not want them to do it? Like understand human psychology, how people mm -hmm. learn and some of those concepts, because a lot of what I see in the technology space, especially with AI, is not only are the good things being amplified, but honestly, a lot of the bad things are being amplified too. And, and that's actually one of the things, and I'll, I'll close here, is that I've seen this so much that I've actually started a series, what I, which I call the Four Minute University. You know, and, and it's really taking all the learnings that I've had throughout my career, throughout my doctoral work and graduate school work, and just explaining with practical and tactical tips how people learn. So one quick example is, for instance, a lot of times people will say, I'm a visual learner. And that's one of the biggest myths around learning, or are you an audio learner or visual learner or reading and writing, et cetera, there. And so that's one of the things that I'm starting to do is to help to explain to people in a very sort of simple, practical manner of the things that, why these are important, how people learn, and what you can do to incorporate that into your everyday work. And so that, that, that's the next big thing I've been doing sort of just as a kind of a passion project. The four minute university is, you know, learn how to learn better essentially is what it is, because that's something that regardless of what machines can do, it's still important for humans to be able to do that. So it'll be. Oh, cool that's so great. I'm glad you shared that. I didn't know about that. Where is it? Where can people access that? Yeah. So they can go on to either my LinkedIn profile or they oh, can yeah. go to, uh, it's on my personal website, it's nabilu.com, okay. N-A-B-E-E-L-O-O.com. And then there's a newsletter that comes out once a week where they can subscribe and uh, okay. I'm listening to my musings. But I also post them on LinkedIn and, and Twitter as well, too. So. Oh, nice. I don't know. I guess I missed it. So I will definitely make sure to include that when we post your episode and I'll include it in um, my May newsletter. So um, thank you again so much for sharing that. And thank you for bringing like simple communication to the topic today and helping people, I think, maybe break down some of those barriers and have a better understanding. Um, I am really glad that you're here today and I am so excited about our consultancy and I look forward to working with you. Looking forward to it as well. Looking forward to, to getting some uh, uh, professional athlete tips from you as well. So <laughs> I, I know you're pretending not to be one, but I, I know an athlete when I see one. So <laughs> <laughs> You're awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Have an awesome day.